Good evening, everyone, and welcome back. We are having our second IVF webinar tonight, as you know, so um, glad to be here once again with another um, special guest, Mandy Rodriguez. She is with us once again, and it's so great to have you here, Mandy. I, it's always a pleasure to, to cooperate, but it's also a great pleasure to uh, see your views uh, and also on, on, of course, infertility, how you um, help the patients. It's always amazing to have you here. Thank you so much for joining. And how are you? I hope you are um, happy Yay. that you are joining us tonight as well. I am very happy. And I live in Africa, everyone. So load shedding and up and down. So as I guide you through my talk, it you will see sometimes my screen. I might just need to stop sharing. But I think you're going to enjoy it. Perfect. I have no doubt here. Okay, so um, Mandy has prepared a really uh, interesting presentation with some videos, so uh, we will play them for, for you as well. And as you know or not, I'm not sure, but Mandy Rodriguez, she's been here with us before, and she know, uh, she is actually the uh, clinical psychologist, and she is right now in South Africa in, uh, in Johannesburg, right, Mandy? And so thank you so much for joining us. And uh, it's always lovely, lovely to, to have you back, that's for sure. And you know that our topic is definitely not easy. And Mandy is here to support you. So remember, we will start with the presentation. But afterwards, as always, it is time for your questions. So don't hesitate, OK? Mandy has been canceling uh, many, 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 many times. So uh, if you have anything that's on your mind that you would like to share or ask, go ahead do it. I am sure she'll be uh, more than happy to help you out. All right. And uh, well, I think we can start with our presentation. First of all, Mandy, yes? Yes. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you so much then. And you yeah. can start sharing your screen. Um, and um, let me make sure that we all see it. Let's go to the beginning. Excellent. I can see it and I believe you can see it as well. But of course, let us know. Thank you so much, Mandy. Go ahead. Okay. Good evening, everyone. And just to let you know, I've been in the field of psychological care and support for couples going through loss and infertility for going on 26 years. And I wanted to start the talk off with something personal. Um, I am not here to say to anyone that when I got cancer, that my cancer I was far easier in terms of my infertility. But I'd just like to share with you that I found the journey very different. I was diagnosed with breast cancer when I was 42, and I'll never forget that day. I am terrified of roller coasters, and I said to my kids, um, well, mommy's going to go with you on everything. And we we kind of screamed and we held one another's hands. And and it I found it easier. I was stage two, but I found it easier because there was an oncologist through this and got 95% success rate of this working. Now, for me, that was phenomenal statistics. So I remember entering this journey and there was some semblance of control because I knew it was almost one scary roller coaster and then it would potentially... Hi, Mandy, please let me know if you can see me because we don't see you. So please bear with us, okay? Mandy will try to reconnect, okay? And let me just check with her. So please wait and let's try and fix this. I think she's back. God. Hi, well, Mandy. Apologies, but you disappeared for like a minute, okay? 
So um, let's try again. Let's let's go back to the previous one, okay? Back to the previous slide. Uh, yes, exactly. Just to make sure we got it all. And now you, we can see you now and hear you. So it's okay. Okay, let me. Okay. Can you see me still, Carolyn? Yes, I can see you now. Okay, now it's all, all okay. Okay. We so just have for like one minute. This one's got no sound. Um, I wanted to show the absolute large group of support that I had. I had nobody saying to me, Mandy, go and see a reflexologist. Mandy, just relax and you're going to get better. In fact, I had people who were there. They were cooking meals. They shared everything with me. Um, and then I look back to why I found my infertility journey so draining. So a few years before, I tried numerous IVFs that didn't work. And I had two early miscarriages. And we all talk about this emotional journey of this roller coaster of infertility. And you kind of climb on this journey even before that first visit. And there's often this feeling of shame and doubt. You don't go to a fertility specialist with him saying you've got a 95% chance of a baby after this. You are thrown on different roller coasters and they start from these ones that are maybe a little bit easier to navigate and they go on to these challenging, difficult rides. And oftentimes there's nobody to hold your hand. And that's why I decided to go into this journey because when I battled with my infertility, it was many years ago. My, my daughter, Vinci, she is now 23. But back all those years ago, there was no support groups. There was no webinars. There was no online management. In fact, there was very little people or, or f even family members who understood what we were going through. And the sad thing is this roller coaster of infertility happens over and over and over again. And you never know when you can jump off. And you're kind of scared if you jump off too soon, that the rest of the ride is gonna go on without you and you're gonna be left behind. So you sit with this dilemma of, do I stay on? I've got no one's hand to hold except other people who are absolutely terrified. Or do I jump off and where do I fit in? And I think one of the scary things about our infertility is the fact that a lot of the journey is up to us. It's not like going to an oncologist who says, Mandy, this is your treatment. This is what we're going to do. Oftentimes with infertility, there's an option for you. There's possibly IVF. There's possibly the next step of donor eggs or surrogacy, any of those journeys. But at the end of the day, it's left up to you. And I think this just makes the journey even more draining. So the next slide is a video that Caroline's going to play from her side. Just a minute video to show you the emotion that people go through.
All right, man. I'm going to have to exit the slide for you so that I can screen share again. I want to share that in, in South Africa, I have found so many of our so many of our ladies and our funnily enough, our support groups that have started are all women who have been through the journey themselves. I want to that was why that slide was so important for me to say that for many of the women, their actual journey was a way of making sense. And they are the most passionate women I have met. They are, I understand a lot of you might say, but they're on the other side because they've been through it and they've got their children. But all of them have this extreme passion and understand what we're going through. And definitely in Africa and South Africa, all of our support groups seem to be run by people who have been through the process and most are psychologists as well. I'm just checking, Carolyn, can you see my next slide? Yes, all is okay. Go ahead. Caroline? Can you see my next slide? Yes, I can see okay. it. Perfect. So if we look at that original roller coaster we go on, this is even before we present to a fertility clinic. There's this kind of, you know, you, you get annoyed because people say, I want a January baby. I don't want a December baby. Or I want a baby in the summer months. And then... You plan your life around it and you start and suddenly there's this surprise and shock that you've been trying your whole life to avoid pregnancy and suddenly there's nothing that's in your control. It drives people, we've noticed, then to some sort of action, to some sort of scrutinizing of your behavior and saying, okay, we know that there's a problem, what can we do? And I find that couples then tend to look at their diet, maybe look at different multivitamins to take, and they kind of saying, well, let me stop smoking, let me address some of these lifestyle factors. And then things are still not happening. And this is where the problem starts coming in this. We start getting irritated with sometimes well-intentioned advice and I call them fertility triggers that start emerging. So it's kind of seeing a pregnant woman and hearing there's a baby shower. And these start emerging to a deeper and deeper strength as we go or, or capacity as we go on to the next roller coaster ride. We then feel angry. And this is where guilt and shame and blame as well might start emerging. And then there's some sort of acceptance of the fact that I need help. And sometimes men get there possibly a bit later than what the ladies do, I've seen. But then there's this acceptance by both that let's move on and let's try and see what we can do about it. So at this stage as, as support groups, this is when we should start support because at this stage, patients are still open to advice and recommendations. They've been on this small roller coaster and they kind of want time to pregnancy to be hastened. There's a lot of research being done on what we call an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but it was research that was published in a keynote address saying, the more fast foods we ate, the longer the time to pregnancy. And basically what this was showing is that if we were not eating in the right way, and I'm not saying in the strict, absolutely um, vegan or, or gluten or all these different diets, but if we were just looking at a simple Mediterranean diet and rather choosing a couple of fruits not 20 fruits a day. So kind of looking at diet, looking at healthy lifestyle in terms of the obvious, like to stop smoking, etc., And then already before is to start managing chronic stress, which I'll get into now, because this is when you feel most receptive. 
now you we enter our fertility clinic and I need you to understand that we go through this grief cycle that starts getting worse as we enter into treatment. So we now learn about our diagnoses probably, um, pre-pregnancy factors, fertility challenges. We start getting overwhelmed with factors that are going to happen during pregnancy. And at this point, the entire multidisciplinary team is important. And I'm a very strong advocate that there should be some sort of counseling, whether it be by a sister or a, a, a um, fertility coordinator, and definitely to include the men. There's amazing research done that if we include the men in, in, in the discussions and helping to make decisions, there is a quicker time to pregnancy. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about Kubler-Ross's cycle of loss. So she was this amazing therapist who said, if we go through grief and loss, we go through these kind of neat stages of a six month so-called grieving process. We go through shock, denial, disbelief, kind of numbing, kind of, I can't believe this has happened. And then we go through some bargaining. Um, why did this happen? Is it because I didn't eat properly? Is it because I had an eating disorder when I was younger? Is it because there's something wrong? Is God angry with me? We then get angry and we tend to internalize. I mean, I remember going through my cycles and every time I got a negative IVF result, I phoned another fertility clinic and I said, I'm coming to see you because I needed to blame someone. I I would then kind of go through this realistic acceptance of the anger and be intolerant and displace it on my husband. You then go through a period of depression and then they say that we have acceptance. But what is the sad thing about infertility is that as you're going through the cycle, and you maybe accept that first step or that first cycle that didn't work or that first month, you're thrown straight back into a cycle of hope again and shock and disbelief. And this just tends to carry on and on and on. And never forget a negative result is definitely like a loss. It's been, it's been likened, infertility has been likened to having a life-threatening illness and a post-traumatic stress, which I'll go through now now. So if we look at the reality of grief, it is not as neat as what Kubler-Ross said. You're actually going from anger to bargaining, to acceptance, to denial, to depression. It's actually all over the place. None of it kind of makes sense. Now, I want to speak about something that's very important where guilt and shame or guilt and blame start emerging in your journey. Why do we feel guilty? I mean, if we look at something like shame, shame is when we doubt ourselves, we internalize, and there's this inability to share because we, we're blaming ourselves for something. Guilt is also, it's feeling bad and blaming ourselves or others. And this is where it's, it starts becoming important in terms of the relationship and in terms of relationship with other people around you. And the sad thing about guilt is under normal circumstances, it's quite a healthy, it's quite a healthy reaction or we would have a bunch of psychopaths running around. It's a, it's a common experience, and the research shows that people spend as much as 13% of their waking day anyway feeling guilty about something, and it's more likely to emerge in those closest to us, especially, like it says, the 93% of those we share it with loved ones and only 7% with strangers. 
But there's this very seductive part of guilt. Because remember, if we can convince ourselves that we're responsible for something, if we've done something wrong and we can say, I'm responsible in some way, guilt has a seductive side where you can maybe fix it. Now, Carolyn's gonna play this video for me as we go. So you know on. your husband goes through challenges with this journey as well. You see how he avoids talking about fertility or hearing the news of a friend's wife being pregnant. And he finds it challenging to follow a healthy lifestyle when his friends have babies and still drink and smoke. And as a husband, you definitely know your wife is going through a hard time because you see it every day. If we look at that, it has an impact on both of you your marriage, your social life, your financial stability, and your intimacy. You both start avoiding social events because you feel you don't fit in. You both have to compromise financially, and your intimacy is a big problem, and maybe both of you don't address this elephant. So we can only but see this as a couple problem. It doesn't matter the reasons for your infertility. The consequences of your infertility are a couple problem. And recent research at ESHRI looking at marriage show a positive relationship exists between a positive partnership and pregnancy outcome. This is something that I am very passionate about is, is what infertility does to the relationship. And I find that a lot of people actually struggle with this in terms of, let me pull up that slide again. Because men and women cope very differently with infertility. In fact, there's books written that people cope very differently, just regardless of infertility. There's a wonderful book written called Why Men Don't Listen and Women Can't Read Maps. And it's shown scientifically that it stereotypes men as being more spatial in thinking and women as being more kind of emotional. And I looked at research, um, it was done over a five year period of how a relationship changes across infertility. In that first year, everyone's coping as a team. You're going to those doctor visits, you're going to your ultrasounds, and you've kind of got this one goal in mind. And as we enter maybe the second or third year, there's a sense of disillusionment, but we're still kind of coping. We're we're going through the injections possibly as ladies. We're saying to our husbands, you don't need to come to all the scans. And then what happens by the fourth or fifth year is a very sad phenomenon, which is called independent coping. So you can just imagine your there's this elephant in the room. Men are geared to fix things and they want to know statistics and they want to know this is the woman I married. If it means that we're not going to have children, possibly, this is the woman I married. And I might be stereotyping a bit, but after 28 years in the field, I've noticed that the men tend to be able to have kind of boxes in their lives. There's a box with hobbies. There's a box with friends. There's a box with work. For women, unfortunately, not having a child impacts, it's just wired all over. Everything impacts on every area of their lives, their social life, their work decisions, their career decisions, what hobbies they can do, how they put their life on hold. So what often happens is men and women start coping independently. I remember being so scared to say to my husband, I'm watching bulletin boards, I'm crying, I'm, I can't do this. I was so scared he would say to me, Mandy, if you can't cope, then we gotta stop. Because oftentimes they love you and they want to fix it. But I was so scared to share that. He was so scared to come home and mention potentially someone's pregnant or 
potentially something not good has happened that day. So we didn't address the elephant in the room. We kind of, you know, if he tiptoed through the door and I looked okay, it was, everything's fine and we would pretend. And I need to tell you that the risk in the marriage is not about the infertility per se. When people come and say, well, is infertility going to destroy my marriage and result in divorce? I can promise you now that maybe in my, all my years of practice, I've had two people who've gotten divorced and for very, maybe reasons specifically related to infertility, but the marriage was not good at the start. Most couples, 98% of the people I see, as that independent coping starts, we are able to do certain role plays and certain games and certain cards that that independent coping does not happen because that's what creates the risk. Now, as I said, intimacy issues has been highlighted as something very important. Sexual concerns, relationship concerns, timing, because it's no longer about recreational intercourse anymore. It's about procreation. So intimacy issues are a big thing. You're not alone in this. And Mandy, apologies. Yeah. We don't see the presentation, okay? So please just click. Okay, there we go. Let me just close this and... Can you see it now? No, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Sorry about this, people. <laughs> it's all right. Okay, hello. Now it's opening. Okay. We can see it now. Thank you. Okay, let me go to my slide. All good now. Thank you. Okay. So if we have a look at the main, it shows in all the research lately that if we do include them, even with, with laparoscopies and endometriosis and those kind of decisions, it definitely has a relationship on stress in a good way, and sexual satisfaction. Now, a very interesting, and the next slide, I'm sure a lot of you have seen it before because it, it did go viral in South Africa. And I say to patients as they sit in front of me, I say to them, are you stressed? Do you think you're stressed? And um, often they'll say, no, about the infertility, I'm stressed. But no, and the husband will say maybe no, or he might say my wife is. But I want you to listen to this clip that Carolyn's going to play and um, brings a bit of humor to it as to what patients say. Is okay, that Diego. up there, Nice Carolyn? to see you again. Hello, doctor. You here for your annual checkup? Yes. Good, good. Before we get started, how's everything been? Eh, you know, I'm still married, so pretty shitty. Oh, you know what they say. Secret to a happy marriage remains a secret. Oh, huh. that, um, that, that doesn't help me at all. Do you smoke? No. You sure? No. You're not sure? I mean, I occasionally have like a cigarette or, or like a joint or crack. It's a yes or no question, Diego. Okay, yes. Do you drink? No. Are you sure? I, I mean, like, at, like casually, like at a party or a wedding or something like that. You know, right, like my house alone every night. What do you drink? Just like a glass of wine at dinner. Okay, that's healthy. And then a shot of tequila. Okay. And then another shot. Um. And then a few more. And then some more. And then I usually pass out. Then I wake up and I take a few more. So the answer is yes. Yeah, I drink. Do you take any drugs? No. Are you sure? I mean, like, I'll, I'll, occasionally I'll smoke a little weed here and there. Like, I'll do a little blow at a party. Some shrooms. Nothing crazy. Yes or no? Yes, I take drugs. Any prescription pills or over-the-counter medicine? No. You sure? 
I mean, I, I take like Advil, Motrin, Tylenol, stuff like that. How often? Um, every time my wife talks to me. Why? Because I know it's going to give me a headache. So the answer is yes. Yes. Diego, are you a stressed person? Me? No, no, not at all. How's your wife? Okay, I'm stressed. You engaging in sexual activity? No. Are you sure? I mean, like, occasionally, like, on our anniversary, stuff like that. And this activity is with your wife? Well, whoever you're having sex with, um, are you using protection? Uh, I, I don't like guns. I mean a condom. Oh, yes. Are you sure? I mean, there are exceptions. How many exceptions? I can't remember. Why can't you remember? Because I drink. Why do you drink? Because I'm stressed. And what do you do when you're stressed? Prescription drugs. And what causes the stress? My life. <sighs> well, Diego, if it isn't obvious already, I'd say the source of the problem is pretty apparent. Yeah, I know. I agree. Obviously, the biggest problem in your life is... That your... I don't drink enough. What? What? <laughs> Okay, so let's screen share that again. This presentation. All right, so the big problem is like Diego was saying is kind of see what it. came okay. first. Can you see this one? Not yet. I guess you need to check. All right. Again. So, so. People will often come to me and say, but Mandy, I'm going through stress. I'm going through infertility. Of course, that's stress, stressful and everyone's going through it. And other people will say, no, I'm not. You know, I, it just helped me with the fertility. And when we look at the studies on acute stress, it had, interesting enough, acute stress is when we stress, our adrenaline goes up and we get off it quickly. So something like aspiration being painful and stressful or a modest increase in stress during IVF or during trying to fall pregnant does not seem to affect IVF outcomes. In fact, the number of eggs maturity, the number of viable embryos and pregnancy outcome was definitely not related to acute stress. And I want you to think about it who falls pregnant in the world? It is often those dealing with acute stress of like COVID-19. It's been a phenomenally bad impact here in South Africa. But during our, we had a hard lockdown last year when it first broke out. We had so many positive pregnancy results and so many people who going through the real stress of losing their jobs and of worrying about getting sick. It wasn't that they relaxed and it happened. It was that they were so busy dealing with real stress that they managed their chronic stress better. So what are we missing? Mindy, shows, yes, apologies. Chronic stress. So a lot Mindy, of I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, can you try to pull up the presentation once again? Okay, this should be the last time, people, because there's no videos left. Sure. Yep. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Now yeah, it's done. I think I will rather leave the slide like that without. Okay. So what are we missing is the role of chronic stress. Now look at this picture and I, I find that burnout we know has become a globally recognized medical condition. All right. We know, especially now with COVID, I mean, it's a very real stress, but what it's become is something chronic. It's, it's, it's walking around chronically worrying about what's going to happen next. We looked at, this was about 24 years ago, we compared people who had kind of no stress. They all had um, either endometriosis or breast cancer or none. And our whole aim was to have a look at what was the relationship between the mind and body. We weren't even looking at pregnancy rate. We were just looking 
is chronic stress at play in people who had more physical illnesses? And the interesting thing is we found that 67% to 83% of people, and back then, this is 24 years ago, the pregnancy rate, let's say, with an IVF was one in three. And if we managed people's chronic stress, their pregnancy rate doubled to two and a half times. And that was a doctoral thesis in 1996. And we're taking this further and it's become a digital portal because not only does it help with the relationship between the mind and body, but it definitely helps with preventing burnout and increasing the way you cope with your infertility. So I want you to imagine if you could manage 90% of your stress, you probably wouldn't believe me. I can promise you, if you, there's certain ways that we can manage stress that 90% of the stuff that you and I are worried about is, is self-induced. It is not so much real. And we're able to teach you when it's healthy to stress, because patients will often say to me, but telling me that stress is at play in my infertility is, is blaming me. And every time I feel stressed, I'm wondering what's going on in my immune system. It's not like that. We are teaching people to recognize stress and teaching them to manage these two different types of stress. You need to have some good stress in your life. If you don't have good stress, you're not going to secrete adrenaline and that's a fight flight response. It helps us cope in the acute situation and it brings in coping skills to, you know, in, in, in South Africa, for example, we have hijacking. So if you see someone approaching you and you put your accelerator down and you get away, that's good stress. But if you are doing that just because there is a deadline, there is a queue at the, the mall, there is a whole lot of emails to download, and you're reacting to it as though it's a real life threatening situation, you're gonna secrete noradrenaline and cortisol. And this is the problem with our stress, and it's 90% of our day. If we look at managing stress, people often say to us, but mainly, I don't want to change who I am. This is what has made me effective. I don't want to change my personality. We're not saying that at all. We're saying this whole journey of infertility is so out of your control. If we can get you some sense of empowerment to help you cope with it and at the same time decrease the impact on the immune system, you're going to have double the chance of conceiving. And of course, I will send you links to, there is an online portal that gets you to manage your stress over a, a 10 session period that I can promise you makes the hugest difference even to someone not dealing with fertility. How else do we deal with infertility? Now, the big thing is to educate yourself. Make something predictable. If you're about to visit a fertility clinic or you're about to go through a process, we deal with stress by making it more predictable and kind of getting that knowledge and getting that action and saying, this is what I'm going to go through. And then to manage expectations of your husband because we would like him to be on the same page of work and family and friends. Oftentimes it's kind of, what do I tell work? I'm gonna be going for scans. What do I say when people have baby showers? What do I do when family and friends say to me, just relax, or I heard of this one who didn't have a uterus or didn't have tubes and fell pregnant after all of it. If the marriage is going through some difficulties, we often say, seek some help because we don't want that independent coping to happen. Again, lifestyle, 
important. And again, I say to people, let's not be obsessive about lifestyle. We tend to look at insulin levels to see if people are eating kind of reasonably. If you find that in the afternoon you're suddenly craving sugar and carbs and there's absolutely no energy whatsoever, we're saying, okay, let's measure that insulin because it does have an impact on your um, equality in the long run. And we we can manage that. So it's the old or, or the new term, that type 2 diabetes. But we can manage it with diet as well. Now, a big thing is also possibly sharing with others. And I know that this is very difficult. If you think about it, one in six of us are actually going through infertility. And oftentimes, the only time we hear about it is when somebody shares that they've had a miscarriage or somebody somebody shares something and suddenly you open up the conversation. And we've got this huge awareness going on in South Africa at the moment about destigmatizing, especially within um, cultural situations, is demystifying that or destigmatizing that infertility and how best to deal with that. There is definitive action you can take. Now, I know everyone says relax and it'll happen. I had to write a chapter for a textbook about 10 years ago. And the textbook or the, the, the chapter was, why do people who adopt fall pregnant? So basically everyone was like, that's not fair because, so you just saying I must adopt in order to feel more relaxed. It was not that. We looked at all the research that was at play and we realized that if people created peace of mind about their journey, so people created a sense of, this is what I'm going through, let's break it into manageable parts and then let's plan for that worst case scenario. Now, I'm not saying that means you go into your fertility saying, if this doesn't work, we'll adopt. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is coming up with, and I'm gonna show you the next sheet, is coming up with general goals in your life. And then with a fertility plan, and that plan is not cast in stone. That plan can be very much if this one doesn't work, in three months I'm going to try again. Or after a year, I draw a line in the sand in terms of what we are doing at this moment in time. And we merge the two together. And that tends to create some sort of peace of mind because we're forcing you to look at the fertility plan, but we're also not making it the only thing. I have so many women who resign from work who who stay in a dead-end job because they want that maternity leave, who don't travel because what if they're ovulating? And so then if they don't fall pregnant, there's no other goals to look forward to. And I often say to my patients, have a look at five-year goals, and you can do this exercise pretty quickly. Your five-year goals, your one-year goals, your three-month goals, without thinking too much. And... The scary thing is a lot of people, it tends to just be fertility related. And there needs to be some that are possibly work related, some that are spending more time with family, maybe health issues. So you're not just working on your lifestyle, et cetera, in order to fall pregnant, but it's for your longevity. And have a look at those goals and merge them together. So I'd like to conclude as to say, when do we seek help? Now, recent research has showed that by the time someone presents to a fertility clinic, they are already 40% of the population are presenting with a psychiatric diagnosis, not because they have a psychiatric problem, but because what they've been through so far, they're usually presenting with depression 
or with anxiety. Um, another thing is post-traumatic stress disorder. I don't know how many of you realize that when, if you buy a white Mazda, suddenly it looks like everyone has bought the same car as you, but it's not like that. It's because it's because you're so aware of it and so engrossed in it that you notice the babies in the trolley, the pregnant and the pregnancy announcements on social media, etc. So it starts creating these triggers in us and we get a post-traumatic stress disorder. So I would really like to conclude that instead of having our lives completely revolving from cycle to cycle. I'm hoping that there's some coping skills that you can have a look at with what I've given you here. And you can log on for free to the stress website, to the, if I just bring it up, to the www.tups.co. It stands for the old type A personality, but we've actually revised it funnily enough since COVID because more and more people are presenting with burnout. So we've actually now calling it a time urgent perfectionist society. And you can test your stress there. And there's six conclusive tests that can then say to you, this is what we recommend. And this is maybe the way to go. And that will be my talk for tonight. I hope I'm very sorry about the slides, um, but I hope that you, you you gathered enough of the videos to, to, let me stop sharing, to help you through your journey. Thank you so much, Mandy. As always, it's been very um, interesting session already with uh, with your presentation. And yes, we apologize for the mix up with the presentation, but I do believe that it's been very useful to you anyhow, because Mandy has always um, has a way to to explain things, and I'm so. <laughs> that you are able to be here with us and uh, because you always put it in such simple words and yet we know that it's very very tough sometimes i think we um, need to hear such things you know because those are obvious things but yet uh, every now and then it's it's good to hear that thank you so much mandy and well now it is time for your questions there is one uh, here ready but of course if you don't have any questions uh, if you would like to share anything or anything that's on your mind you can go ahead do it now and if you don't feel like doing this it's still okay remember there is also an option to get in touch with mandy and i'm sure that she'd be more than happy to help you out as well right absolutely, absolutely. perfect so let's have a look okay we have the first um message here actually i've had two ivf and three miscarriages my latest ivf failing on the 27th i'm 40 now i feel i'm out of options don't feel like crying every single day and never imagined life without kids i'm so sorry i i know what it's like to have miscarriages and i really urge you to listen to my talk on on thursday night which is about recurrent miscarriages because you've had, in essence, two IVFs, then three miscarriages. And I guess, you know, we turn 41 and we start panicking that what is my AMH looking like, my number of eggs and my egg quality. And I find it interesting, people, these two beakers that I need you to have a look at. One is filled with absolute sadness and devastation at what's happening. And people think, in order for me to get closure and maybe move on to the next step, they need to deal with all that sadness and lies. And only then can closure start building. But I, I need to urge you that the two happen together. And I think as Lungili, I, I really would think if you could have a have a look at what potentially would be the next options. Doesn't mean you've got to take them at all. But 
allow yourself to explore what another option possibly is before you give up because and before you make that next step think how far am i willing to take this and i promise you you'd be surprised to actually say well you know what i've explored and i'm not sure of your circumstances but i've explored donor eggs and you know what that's not for me but you've done it and it helps you with your closure or you read it and and it starts feeling a bit familiar and like there's a bit more hope. And I know imagining life without kids is is dreadful. I, I like I say, with my cancer was far easier than imagining my life without children. So I really urge you to listen on Thursday night where we have a look at how to deal, especially with recurrent loss. Thank you so much indeed. And yes, uh, Mandy is right. Don't worry, she'll be back. <laughs> so I hope you will be able to join us and uh, I'm sure it's going to be interesting as well. So, And of course, best of luck, that's for sure. Um, let's have a look. Lisa has one more question. So how much the partner should get involved when de dealing with stress during IVF cycle? I mean, dealing with the stress alone or with the partner together? So there's very interesting research lately that there is an impact on sperm, quality of sperm, insulin levels, even autoimmune diseases in men who are more stressed. And it takes the two of you, and I often, if I can get the partner in, even if it means just dealing with your stress together. The thing is, you're learning from one another, you're learning skills that you can use together and avoiding that independent coping. So for me, the ideal is dealing with it together because that is a huge part of your stress, is how you're both dealing individually and how can we merge that together so that we're on the same page. So yes, I feel there's definitely, I mean, the original research on psychoneuroimmunology showed that men, regardless of whether they changed their diet, stopped smoking, ate less red meat, if they didn't manage their stress, they were at risk for a another heart attack or a subsequent heart attack, or no matter what they did with their lifestyle, if they didn't change stress, the immune system was still impacted on. So I definitely think it is something you should deal with together. And remember, a lot of this is online because now virtually you can do this on an app on your phone and you can do it together. And so, so COVID has given us the one positive that a lot of AI programs have been developed in order to manage this together. So yes, I would strongly recommend that. Thank you, Lisa, of course, for um, that question. Definitely interesting. And of course, Mandy, as always, you've been excellent with your um, with sharing what you know works best. So thank you so much. And as you can see, next one is pretty long, but let's have a look then, of course. I had one natural pregnancy with missed miscarriage, age 45, then eight fake donor egg IVF with two different donors. The last one failed last week. The stress has been immense uh, for the past five years and put so much pressure on the relationship. I am now 49 and ran out, ran out of options. My partner is desperate to have his own child and decided if this didn't work, we would need to go separate ways. I think stress has had a major impact in the process and each time the stress gets harder. Absolutely. I am so sorry. I mean, that is quite a journey to have gone through. And at the age of 45, and then and then to go through, you know, everyone says you use an egg donor and your statistics are 80, 70%. So to have had two different donors and to have eight failed donor cycles is, is extremely stressful and the pressure on the relationships, so difficult. Um, 
I really think that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, maybe I'm a bit of a fatalist in terms of, of, of when I do couple counseling, etc. And I kind of think, you know what, if, if somebody wants to leave me for this, what if the stress got worse in the future? What if we had children and it got worse? Would this person still be there for me? Um, and that's why it is important to manage the coping together, to manage this independent coping, because even having children and having options that work it's not that we want to have this easy escape route. And I would really say that we need to manage your stress and we need to look at how far each of you are willing to take it. You know, I'm not sure if you did pre-genetic screening with your donors. I'm not sure um, if you did, yeah. So here we call it PGS or PGD. I'm not sure if those particular donors were not great donors. I'm not sure if they froze in cycles, but you, you're more than welcome to email me. And again, to also listen to that talk. Um, so you've had every test possible, but no pre-genetic screening. Look, I, I am not a, a fertility specialist. I'm married to one, but I'm not one. If I was sitting there, I, I make a lot of decisions in the clinic that we discuss in a team. My next step, honestly, would be to possibly do pre-genetic screening if you're getting quite a few donor embryos or donor, um, um, donor conceived embryos is possibly to have pre-genetic screening to just eliminate that you know, who knows? There may be a sperm problem. I'm not sure what the meiosis test is that to do with the sperm. Yes. So you see, I, I, and this again, we don't want to get involved in a blaming or shaming or guilty situation but to have so many donor cycles and then to possibly look at sperm i would strongly recommend that you do pre-genetic screening because then we could eliminate well is it the donor eggs or do we possibly need donor gametes which i know is is a big step i don't know if it would help you knowing it is not it's a shared a shared journey you're going on and nobody is to blame it is it's not just you you know so i don't know that test is frightening i guess to have and i'm not sure how long that's going to take but if we find out it is the sperm then you know somebody leaving you because it's not working in you, it's kind of counterproductive. It's not going to work with somebody else. I, I, you know, and you can definitely email me because I think it's quite a complicated situation and I don't want to either myself blame or shame or say this is the next step you should take. Thank you so much, Wendy, indeed. And as you can see, there is a thank you for you. And yes, remember that you can get in touch with Wendy and I'm sure it will be even more helpful to just have that, um, have more details as well, right, Wendy? Thank you so much indeed also for, for sharing. And uh, this is definitely tough to even look at and, and I can only imagine how difficult that can be. Yes. That's for sure. So, uh, at least at this point, I don't see more questions, uh, but I would already like to thank everyone for uh, staying with us, for sharing, um, because, of course, as we know, those are difficult things to, to talk about. Um, so let's give it a second. If there's anything you would like to ask, you know what to do. 
If not, we will be finishing. But uh, Mandy, thank you so much. And before, okay, <laughs> can you also <laughs> tell us what is the email address that to be used, Mandy, just in case? For my own email, it would be Mandy, M-A-N-D-Y, at MedFem. So like Medical Feminine, M-E-D-F-E-M dot C-O dot Z-A. But if you go onto my website, MandyRodriguez.com, all the links will be there, all the phone numbers, the contact details, the stress course, There's even, there's blogs on how to share with family and friends and what to say to them and even a pamphlet you can print in terms of giving to family and friends. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I have put the email address in the chat section. You can use this and just, you know, get some more details and answers. In the meantime, we did receive one more question from Lisa. So I guess we can still have a look at it. Yeah. I would like to perhaps to try an adoption, but my husband doesn't want it and doesn't even want to talk about it. Should I try to convince him somehow? You know, the wonderful thing, I don't know how many men are watching, but the wonderful thing about men is they kind of, they kind of, um, they will often say to me, I'm not doing IVF. I'm not paying for IVF. I'm not even going to a fertility specialist because I'm not shooting blanks. I'm not doing. And then, and then, Men hit that T-junction. And even the ones who didn't want to take the next step further, they do. So the women tend to look at what is my worst case scenario and I'm going to try this, I, that next step. And they are very open, more open than what you think to look at the next step, but they almost want more science, more hitting that T-junction and you would be surprised at how many of them then actually look at the next step. But I definitely think it's something you should explore together and bring out those fears in, in terms of what he has. And, you know, um, yes, you've, you've tried options, but there is still donor gamete. But again, we don't know if, if that is, is a viable option. But I would say don't take it as a no when your husband says no. <laughs> I, when he reaches that T-junction, he is more likely to look at the next step. But you will reach that T-junction first. And then I think that discussion needs to be opened up. Again, thank you so much, Lisa. And of course, again, for your advice, Mandy. And uh, it looks like that was our final um, question. And uh, thank you so much. And before we finish, is there anything else, Mandy, you would like to add? So just in terms of I finish, uh, any other questions? Oh, I thank you. It's a thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so what I'm saying is, Manage your stress, your chronic stress, because not only does it help you conceive, it helps you cope with the process better by empowering you. Think about taking a nutrient or just watching, not obsessive about your diet. Because what creates stress is when we're obsessive about plastics and estrogen and what are we taking in, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, be reasonable about that. And then focus on that marriage. Don't lose your marriage over something that we can help you both come to terms. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that ending as well, because those are the key points here that you mentioned. Someone is typing, so I just want to uh, wait and see. Probably it's another thank you, but as you can see, Lisa has said that you've been a very helpful. Thanks for bringing these topics. And yes, indeed, there is another thank you with a little bit hard thank for you, you as well. Thank, thank you, you, Caroline. And once again, sorry about the sound, but we will get this right for Thursday. But yes. I really think Thursday night's talk will help a lot of you because it does look at the grief 
and loss in terms of going forward, not only with recurrent loss, but in terms of, of what you're going through and a negative result is a grief reaction. So I would really recommend you, you log on for that talk. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you so much indeed. And I already you know that we will be back with Mandy. So don't hesitate, sign up and join us on uh, at 8 p.m. UK time, of course. And I'm sure it's going to be, again, interesting. As you can see, Mandy has lots and lots of um, things to, to add and advice. So it's just... It's easy to join, so you know, just don't don't hesitate and do it. And as you know, also this has been recorded. So if anyone missed any part of this, you will be able to watch this again on my Avi Offenses. It will be available tomorrow. And if you go to our YouTube channel, you will be able to see it as well. And of course, um, well, what I can say after this um, session, it's always great to bring such topics. It's very, very important to bring such topics. And I'm very happy that we are able to talk about it because it's still not discussed enough, as you all know. So however we can help, we are here, right? Yes. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank for spending you. this evening with us. Take care, everyone. And Mandy... I will see you very soon as well. Thank you so Thank much. You, Take care. The better connection, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. No doubt here. Thank you so much. And bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.